I've pointed out a horizontal mirror effect between Donkey Kong Country 2 and Donkey Kong Country 1. There's also a vertical mirror effect within Donkey Kong Country 2 itself. The first and last areas are ships of some sort. The second and sixth areas are guarded by stone faces. Areas 5 and 3 are set in forests. And Crazy Kremland, the fourth, stands in the centre, possibly doubled by Chaos Core, the two places that are being held up by Cruncher statues. The number four is representative of the centre, also in its position as a cross, uh, the cross of Kremlin heads, and the X, which signals the treasure, the Axis Mundi of the self. The island itself is a mandala, and Crazy Kremland is the heart. The path from the heart takes you first to the depths of the forest, then you're devoured by the snake's head, and then you're reborn as the phoenix. The treasure map also places Crazy Kremland as the key area, whereas in Donkey Kong Island it is Congo Jungle, the first area, which is being marked. Crazy Kremland is the first area of Crocodile Isle, not Gangplank Galleon, because it's the only area that isn't doubled. We enter Crocodile Isle through Crazy Kremland, the game land, and in a macrocosmic way we enter Donkey Kong Country 2 through the game cartridge. Donkey Kong Country 2 seems to be openly making reference to, or gaining awareness of, its status as a video game. As said before, it's the first game where Swanky Kong appears, the Game Master, inviting you to come and play. Donkey Kong Country 2 is, of course, also in the centre of Donkey Kong Country 1 and Donkey Kong Country 3. If Chaos Core is the centre of wealth in this game, Crazy Kremland acts as its outward reflection. The area is home to King Zing, a monarch and therefore a ruler over a large wealth in this case Honey. Other rare games return to this theme of Honey as wealth, such as Conker's Bad Fur Day, where a bank robbery is conducted with Honey instead of gold, and the Banjo games also have an underlying sense, in my opinion, that Honey is more than food. It is gold, and in its symbolic sense it is life, libido, life energy. The king rules over the center of the island where the gold lies. Funnily enough, his spouse, Queen Bee, also has her home in the center of the island, in Vine Valley, also the fourth location on the map counting Donkey Kong's cabin. The fourth location acts not only as a vertical center to the islands, but also as its horizontal center. In Donkey Kong Country 2, King Zing is the only winged boss apart from Crow. King Zing is the only boss you don't greet with the usual surprise animation, as if he weren't quite real. His presence doesn't shock you. He is, after all, the boss of a haunted theme park, the only other boss of a ghost area apart from Crow. Furthermore, it is worth noting that Ghost Crow is the only boss who doesn't appear on the official list of the game's bosses. There is something ghostly or not quite real about him. He's a fantasy, an illusion, a spirit. In a similar way to Crow, the Zingers are the only other animal we see laying eggs and giving birth to new life. The Queen and the King are a mother and a father. From the union of these two comes a third. It is not until Donkey Kong Country 3 that the eggs hatch and we are flooded with new life. The game is swimming in banana birds, the children of the queen. In Donkey Kong Country 2, all winged animals are still laying eggs. In Donkey Kong Country 3, they have hatched. From one angle, both of these queens are queens of sweet golden food. Both queens, furthermore, are located in divine or holy places. Since Queen Bee is the boss of the island temple, a place of spirituality, and Queen Banana Bird is queen of the holy heavens. The king, on the other hand, is ruler over a land of material pleasure, earthly games, the theme park. These themes, to me, begin to remind me of another pair of mother and father characters, Wrinkly and Cranky. Apart from being married, 
Their role as complementary symbols is signalled by them both occupying opposing crockheads in K. Rule's keep, the Queen and the King. Cranky's domain are video games, memorabilia. It is very rooted in the sensual enjoyment that comes from physical existence. Wrinkly seems more drawn to austerity, dedicating life to learning, teaching, less material and more intellectual or spiritual concerns. What they both have in common is a respect for memory. Wrinkly wants you to learn, remember, obtain knowledge. She saves your progress, so the game memory. This way the past is saved. Cranky wants you to remember what came before you, the heritage and tradition this game draws from. The museum is a place to come into contact with artifacts from the past. This is the trait shared among most of the helper characters. As I said, Clubber's kiosk leads you to the lost world, a prehistoric era. Funky's flights only lets you travel back in time to worlds you've previously visited. So a crazy theory starts to emerge here. Diddy is returning to the past to remember something he's forgotten. He is knocked unconscious and thrown into a barrel in Donkey Kong Country, and at the end of Donkey Kong Country 3, he breaks free from chaos, another empty barrel. In the interval between those two games, he is surrounded by the archetype of the prison cell, the empty shell. It's like the entire Donkey Kong Country series, at one level, can be read as Diddy's escape from the barrel. He is put in there in Donkey Kong Country, but doesn't realize it. In Donkey Kong Country 2, a creeping awareness starts to tell him that maybe something is fishy, and at last, in Donkey Kong Country 3, he comes out into the world. In order to remember the past, to remember that we are in a barrel, we ascend from the murky depths of consciousness and spread our wings towards consciousness. Atop each mountain is a giant divine bird, the archetype of the phoenix. So in a mythological sense, the ascent up the island is a quest to encounter this bird of golden fire or of spirit. In each game, the bird symbol becomes progressively more divine. And microcosmically too, as we climb up Crocodile Isle, we find three-winged bosses who are like reflections of the higher bird, premonitions of what is to come. First, Crow, lowly and material. Then, Zinger, a king, Material, but with kingly power. Then, Ghost Crow, a spirit. Finally, the Divine Bird. So why does Donkey Kong's cabin have its own area icon when it's clearly just part of the intro sequence? Well, by adding it on, we get eight areas, just like the other two games. This could allow us to mirror the first and last areas, like with the Flying Croc and Gangplank Galleon. But in this case, it's Donkey Kong's cabin and the Gangplank Galleon. Several clues point in this direction. First, both of these areas are home to the archetype of the cabin where the bad news is given. The news about a certain loss, a certain lack which sparks the adventure. Donkey Kong's cabin, despite not being on a ship, serves a similar role as the captain's cabin. Furthermore, Donkey Kong's cabin is decorated with a single painting of two ships. One is up front, one is in the distance. The cabin itself, then, is decorated with a symbol of the ship, the vessel. This would mean that the first areas of Donkey Kong Country 1 and 2 are somehow related to captain's cabins or to wooden vessels of some sort. Donkey Kong Country 3 follows in this line with the first area, Lake Orangutanga, being home to Barnacle Bear, an old sailor or captain. The whole area is filled with wooden buildings, wooden cabins built on water. Barnacle Bear, furthermore, is a collector of empty shells, and the boss of the area is Belcher, a wooden barrel filled with animal life. As I said in my Donkey Kong Country 3 analyses, Donkey Kong Country 3 is even more filled with empty shell symbolism than the previous games, as if Diddy's awareness of his situation reaches a peak until he is liberated. So in any case, all three starting levels are wooden shells where we learn about a certain lack, a void at the core of the structure. Interestingly, all three first levels have a tradition of starting with a rodent enemy, the, first, the very first enemy we encounter in each game. Rats, 
and especially rats located in wooden environments, suggest to me that there is something gnawing at the core of the structure. There are rats infesting the underbelly of the cabin. Or maybe the very nature of the cabin is to be infested with rats. The cabin and the rat go together as a pair. In the Japanese box art, we see that the door to the captain's cabin is guarded by two cross swords, where Cruncher would stand in the other box art, the same place. Inside the cabin itself, we're also greeted by a sword. The only other location with two cross swords is Cranky's cabin, now a museum, and the swords are also placed under Cruncher, a visual pattern that gets repeated in several instances. There was meant to be a villain in this game who didn't make it to the final version, Mr. X, a prototype for Cackle. In previous videos I have suggested how Cackle and Cruncher could be two faces of the same archetype. Mr. X, then, is both the ghost or consciousness of the island and also the treasure of the island, since X marks the treasure. Mr. X, or Cackle, lives inside a library a place full of books and words, language. Cackle's name refers to laughter, a human voice. The conscious mind of the island is the spirit of language from which conscious memories and thoughts are made. Mr. X has no name, no word associated to him. He is a mystery. As a side note, the letter X is the Roman numeral for the number 10, and the letters for chaos add up to 10. Chaos, or the void, is also a place of no language, or the indescribable heart at the centre of the library, the void from which meaning emanates. The rat in the cabin, which sets our adventures in motion. <laughs>